All right, what's happening, y'all, man? It's your boy Rico from Street Scores. We have to take a nice, detailed look at this wide receiver situation, man. It is crazy. After we just drafted Dex Milne, we have 14 wide receivers currently on the roster. What do you mean? How? And last year, only five made the 53-man roster, but I'm assuming they're going to have to make it six this year. But even then, we have to go from 14 to six. And I really don't know how they're going to do it. They have their work cut out for them. Man, this 53-man roster is going to be crazy. But I love it. Heavy competition is going to be the best of the best left standing. And our receiving core going into next season should be way better than last season. It should actually go from one of our biggest weaknesses to potentially one of our best strengths. But the catalyst of this video was us taking Dax Milne 258th overall with our final pick in the draft. So of course I have to do a full breakdown of who he is and why the pick was great, what's his ceiling, what are his positives and negatives and things like that. We'll get to that at the end. But first, we're going to analyze this receiving group. I'm breaking down each receiver on the roster and what they bring to the table, what they're good at, what they're bad at. And I have it broken up in three tiers. There's the three on top, the super safe guaranteed locks to make the team tier. Then receivers four through ten are all maybes. We don't know. Granted, they're at varying degrees of safe and unsafe, but generally all of the guys four through ten are auditioning for their jobs come training camp. And then there's also another three who were on the injury reserve last season, and I don't expect them to make the roster at all, but I still at least have to mention their names. And then lastly, we're going to talk about Dax Milne at the end of the video, the second half of the video. Let's get it. Alright, so first up, man, you already know what it is, man. Number one, Terry McLaurin, 2019 third round pick, still on his rookie contract. He is a number one receiver, the number one receiver on this team, but just in general, he's a number one receiver. He has elite speed. He has crazy contested catch ability, especially statistically. Just look at the advanced statistics and the numbers and the percentages. He's literally top five in the NFL at that. He's also one of the best route runners in the NFL. He's a great leader captain he's a matchup nightmare and on top of all of that he's a great and willing blocker i mean that's one of the main reasons we drafted him because we felt like at the very least he can block very well he's a passionate blocker and he can contribute in special teams as a gunner well he turned out to be one of the best receivers we've ever had on our team in burgundy and gold history so now he's not doing any of that special team stuff but that still helps him and translates to him being a wide receiver on offense as well then number two curtis samuel drafted 2017 second round pick signed in the offseason for three years 34.5 million he's a number two receiver a great one he has elite speed he is an elite deep threat again look at the advanced statistics the percentages he is crazy He's very versatile, can play literally any receiver position. So can Terry McLaurin, honestly. But he's just so great at being an ex. It feels like you're almost wasting his time putting him anywhere else. It's kind of like sending Chase Young in coverage where he's actually pretty good at it. Like his coverage ability is underrated. But what you want Chase Young doing every play is penetrating, trying to get into the backfield at all costs. Same thing with Terry McLaurin. So he's very versatile, but Curtis Samuel is the type of versatility where we're actually going to use him like that. He's going to make plays out of the backfield, like literally line up as a running back occasionally. We've seen that on film. We've seen Scott Turner use him in that way. He's going to be using screens. He can play the slot. He's actually played some of his best football in the slot, but he's also so versatile that we can use him in the backfield and on the outside that we're more than likely not going to use him in the slot that much. And that's why we drafted a Dax Milne. That's why we signed an Adam Humphreys, because we're trying to get a pure slot receiver so Curtis Samuel can be free to move everywhere. But I'm still expecting him to make plays in the slot, but Scott Turner is going to use him everywhere. Again, even including in the backfield. And he's a very underrated route runner. He's not Terry McLaurin, but he's also not this gadget Tavon Austin type guy that a lot of people think he is. He's actually an underrated route runner. He's pretty solid. He can definitely separate and get open on his own against man coverage one on one easily. I mean, I've literally done a film breakdown on Curtis Samuel after we drafted him. So go check that out to see what I'm talking about. I also have some Terry McLaurin film sessions out there as well. Go check that out. Diami Brown. And I'm going to be doing film sessions on this entire draft class 
and Jarrett Patterson, the undrafted free agent running back that we just signed because he's just that different that I have to do a film session on him even though we technically didn't draft him. But back to De'Ami Brown, drafted 2021 this season with a third round pick, our second of our third round picks, fourth pick overall in our draft. Of course, he's on a rookie contract. He is an XYZ receiver, very versatile. He was the best deep threat in the draft. His athletic potential is actually way higher than his RAS reading says. Like he didn't test very well and he looks way faster and explosive and agile on tape than his tests indicate from his pro day. Definitely has a high ceiling. I mean, people are literally comparing him to Terry McLaurin and Stephon Diggs. And for different people to compare him to two different receivers who have very similar play styles, Stephon Diggs and Terry McLaurin, that means that those comps are actually make sense. It's not like they're comparing them to D-Hop and then Terry McLaurin or Odell Beckham and Mike Evans two completely different play styles is Terry McLaurin and Stephon Diggs who are honestly the closest comps to each other that you can probably give and they're comparing De'Ami Brown to that he's very versatile like I said I mean he can even make plays out of the backfield with his elite yak ability his route running is trending upwards he even said it in his press conference after we drafted him. North Carolina's offense was stifling his development because they just didn't ask him to run a lot of routes, but the routes that he did run, he started to get better and better. And towards the end of this past season, he actually became a pretty good route runner. And he could still work on a few things, but even though he didn't run the entire route tree in college, there's nothing that really tells me he can't do it at the NFL level. So I'm expecting him to be one of the better route runners in the NFL as well. I definitely see that trending upwards. And he's also a great blocker as well. One of the best blocking receivers in this draft. So we're getting the best deep threat, one of the best blockers, and also potentially one of the most versatile and potentially one of the best route runners in this draft class in the third round. That's ridiculous. But as you see, all of these guys had gold backgrounds because they're tier one pretty much guaranteed to make this team. And I forgot to include this in the image, but De'Ami Brown is also one of the best contested catch receivers in this class. Arguably the best. Out of 49 contested catch targets, he didn't drop a single one. Now he has some concentration drops where like it's just an easy catch and he drops those. But when it comes to contested catches, when you need somebody to make a play in the clutch, he's your guy. I mean, he may be the most dependable in that way out of anybody on our entire roster and potentially one of the best in the league. I mean, bro, 49 contested catch targets, not one drop. Like, come on, bro. Now we're to tier two with receivers four through 10, starting with Kelvin Harmon. 2019 sixth round pick still in his rookie contract of course he's a possession receiver red zone threat probably has the best hands on this team kelvin Harmon, based on what he did the season that he was healthy his rookie season 2019 you could say he probably has the best hands on this team i mean his one hand catches were ridiculous 2019 he's also a very aggressive blocker i would like for him to improve some of his technique but there's no reason that he shouldn't be as good of a blocker as Terry McLaurin and Deontay Brown, or maybe even better just based on his stature, his length and his strength. But he just has to improve technique wise to get there. But he's definitely a very aggressive and willing blocker. You can tell he relishes the opportunity to really just punish DBs when he's blocking them. Also, it's reported that he improved his route running right before he sustained that season ending injury in the 2020 offseason. And that was his biggest concern. His inability to separate, his lack of route running. He's never going to be like a freak athlete, very explosive and things like that. He's just a big body, great contested catch guy. But if he's improved his route running, oh man, it's over with. Kelvin Harmon is easily the fourth best receiver on this roster if his route running is good. That was the main thing holding him back, his inability to separate. And then also, will he be able to bounce back from a season in an injury? Like, first of all, is he even healthy enough to play? Is he healthy enough to even make the team? Will he fully recover? And even if he does recover, will he be what he used to be? He was already not a great athlete, but after that injury, will he be an even worse athlete? So who knows? We'll see. Next up, Antonio Gandy Golden, 2020 fourth round pick last year. 6'4", that's an advantage in itself, that size. The Burgundy and Gold Rivera and Company 
have been really trying to find a big receiver this offseason. We were even trying to trade for Nikhil Harry, but the Patriots asking price was too high. And I'll, that's why I'm very surprised we didn't go Simi Fajoko because he was Davis Mills' best target. And he's a huge possession receiver type of target like Antonio Gandy Golden, but he has more athletic upside. But the Cowboys got him, so now I got to root against him. But back to Antonio Gandy Golden, 6'4". So he's a possession receiver, red zone threat, great jump ball ability, and one of his most underrated traits is his underrated release against press. Usually guys that are 6'4", your best strategy to stopping them is to press man them and jam them at the line and disrupt their timing and their routes because they usually don't have good releases. For some reason, even though his testing doesn't necessarily indicate this, he has a great release. You can't press man him. So he's a mismatch nightmare if we're able to develop him. He's also a long strider. He's not fast. He's not very quick, but he does have good buildup speed. And then this season is technically going to be his rookie season because the very limited amount of times that we saw him last season, it wasn't enough to really gauge if he's going to be good or not. I mean, Scott Turner in that Browns game, the game he got hurt in, was even trying to force him the ball. He was like, bro, all right, this game, we got to see what we have in Antonio Gandy Golden. We got to see throwing them screens and everything, just forcing them touches. And I like that. Last year was an experimental season, like I told a lot of y'all before the season even happened, and I'm glad we took risks like that. We were just experimenting with players. We were experimenting with personnel groupings, schemes, play calling, everything. And we needed a sacrifice season like last year so that we can be better equipped Super Bowl contenders of the future. And one of the experiments we had was Scott Turner just throwing guys out there. I mean, even like we put Marcus Ball on the practice squad to see what Tamarine Hemingway could do. He didn't impress, so we brought Marcus Ball back. And again, in that Browns game, we were just forcing Antonio Gandy Golden the ball like he was the number one receiver because Scott Turner just wanted to see what we had in him. And we didn't expect him to get hurt. We were expecting to be able to see more of him that season. Again, this upcoming season is technically his rookie season. He technically just redshirted last season. He got hurt within the first four games. And then, just like Kelvin Harmon, will he be able to bounce back from his injury? Is he going to be fully healthy? Will he be even Will he even be ready for off-season workouts and practice programs? And even if he is ready, will he be what he used to be, athletic? Next up, Adam Humphreys. He was a 2015 undrafted free agent. We signed him this off-season on a one-year, $1.19 million deal. And easily the most proven slot guy on our team. Definitely the most proven, just pure slot. That's why we signed him. Rivera has said recently, like as of yesterday, with his press conferences, that they wanted a pure slot. That's why we drafted Dax. That's why we signed Adam. They're not playing about that slot. Even though Curtis Samuel can play in the slot, even though Deami Brown can, even though Terry McLaurin can, you can tell they want bigger and better things out of those guys. So they want a pure slot to primarily take that role and allow those other guys, all of the guys with the gold backgrounds, to move everywhere else on the field and stay on the outside. But Adam Humphreys, most proven pure slot easily. And he's also a very tough runner not afraid to get hit and this is great in two ways first of all remember Terrell Pryor and Trey Quinn who were training cap warriors I mean we thought we were hitting on those and then when we got to real games they were afraid to get hit dropping easy passes over the middle because they were bracing for impact from linebackers you don't have that problem with Adam Humphreys because the second part of that is that he also likes to run through people I mean, he's a shifty guy, so he tries to avoid contact and juke people out their socks. But at the same time, he will try to run over a DB. He'll just layer his shoulder right through him and run them over, just straight truck stick. He also has chemistry with Ryan Fitzpatrick. That's probably the most notable part of his positives. Because that chemistry with Ryan Fitzpatrick, as of right now, he's Ryan Fitzpatrick's favorite receiver. He's the only guy on this roster that Ryan Fitzpatrick has chemistry with. And it makes sense that we signed Adam Humphreys because we have Ryan Fitzpatrick. We drafted Terry McLaurin not probably all because of Dwayne Haskins, but that was definitely a big part of it. Same thing with Ryan Fitzpatrick. We signed Ryan Fitzpatrick, bring over at least one receiver that he's used to throwing to, so he at least has somebody familiar that he already has chemistry with heading into offseason practices. So that gives Adam Humphreys a leg up on the competition. And also, he's the most experienced receiver on this roster in general. Like, he's the oldest. He's been on the most teams. So that definitely goes in his favor as well. But will he be healthy? And I'm honestly more concerned about his injuries 
than Kelvin Harmon's and Antonio Gandy Golden's just off of the fact that his were uglier. Like his were concussions last season. I mean, he barely played. I mean, granted, Antonio Gandy Golden really only technically played like one real game before he got hurt. And Kelvin Harmon didn't play at all. But again, Adam Humphrey's injuries were like concussions and stuff. Kelvin Harmon and Antonio Gandy Golden were leg injuries. And I'm still worried about them bouncing back from that. But I mean, concussions that leave you out for like the vast majority of a season sounds really dangerous. But we'll see. Then you have Cam Sims undrafted free agent from 2018 we re-signed him this offseason to a one-year 2.133 million dollar deal and that's more than i actually thought it would be he's six five that's a huge positive again they're really looking for some guys with size and some red zone threats who knows if logan thomas or samus reyes john bates can step up and be those guys for us but they're not just putting all of their eggs in one basket they're hoping that they can get that out of a receiver as well and of course with his size he's a possession receiver a red zone threat and most notably he showed flashes when there was finally better qb play in 2020 when Alex Smith had some pretty good quarters, because again, I don't think Alex Smith ever had just a good game, but he had some good quarters. He put together some pretty good drives and Cam Sims definitely shined during those moments. Same thing with Taylor Heineke. Once Taylor Heineke took over, Cam Sims looked the best he looked all season. For pretty much any receiver ever, QB play, of course, improves their ability to perform and be productive. But Cam Sims, like, it was a big difference, like a bigger difference than usual going from bad quarterback to good quarterback and then is he healthy now out of all of the guys Kelvin Harmon Adam Humphreys and Antonio Gandy Golden his health concerns are probably the lowest but still remember that 2018 season with Alex Smith when we first got him Adrian Peterson when we first got him we were six and three before the major Alex Smith injury and we ended up being one of the most hurt teams ever Cam Sims the very first game of the season sustained a season ending injury and he clearly bounced back last year but still just something to note not a big negative again i'm nowhere near as worried about his health in comparison to kelvin Harmon, antonio gandy golden and adam humphreys but it's still something to note then you have steven sims man probably the biggest disappointment out of this entire list 2019 undrafted free agent during Dwayne Haskins rookie season after Terry McLaurin was hurt it was just Steven Sims and Kelvin Harmon and they were balling I mean they stepped up big Kelvin Harmon was grabbing everything thrown to him nobody could cover Steven Sims one-on-one -on -one. elite separator elite speed elite quickness I mean it was crazy then come 2020 one of the most inconsistent receivers I've ever seen in a burgundy and gold uniform based on like what we expect out of him and what he gave us easily one of the most inconsistent in recent years and one of the reasons that he was also one of the most inconsistent is because it wasn't just at receiver it was also at returner every time the ball was getting punted to us and i knew steven sims was back there as the returner i was nervous while the ball was in the air because who knows what's gonna happen man he was a muff punt waiting to happen and even when he would catch it he wasn't flipping field position so i don't know man the potential is all there the speed is there the explosion the agility even the route running but he has to get his hands back his hands man as far as a receiver and a returner i don't know what happened i don't know if somebody space jam took his powers in the 2020 offseason i don't know if he was eating popcorn and fried chicken before every game in the 2020 season but for some reason his hands were just terrible last season severely inconsistent and it's crazy because when we first got him as an undrafted free agent in 2019 his hands were inconsistent in the beginning and then his hands improved mightily by the time the season ended and then for some reason coming back to 2020 butterfingers i don't know so the biggest question can he bounce back to his 2019 form because if he can if we can get last four games of the 2019 season out of steven sims he's our best slot receiver and that's even including dax milne and adam humphreys he's at least the most explosive with the highest potential and the highest ceiling but i just highly doubt he'll get back to that form because he was bad not only just for like a couple of games last year but just the entire season it just looked like a completely different guy out there I wouldn't have recognized it was him if I didn't know what he looked like and knew his jersey number. Next up, Isaiah Wright, 2020 undrafted free agent, rookie contract as well. He's a versatile guy, can play running back, wide receiver, returner. I mean, literally, Antonio Gibson, just more receiver than running back, whereas Antonio Gibson is more running back than receiver. And he has a lot of athletic upside as well, just like Antonio Gibson. He's not quite the athlete of Antonio Gibson, but he's the tier right below that. And then his biggest negative, still very raw i mean we were trying to throw to him and get him involved all last season 
and it just never really worked out. His route running is still raw. His hands are still inconsistent. He has a lot of things to work on. But again, versatile guy, running back receiver and returner. We'll see. Then lastly, out of the guys with the burgundy backgrounds is DeAndre Carter, 2015 undrafted free agent. We signed him this season to a one year $970,000 deal. And right now he's our most proven returner easily. It's not even close. He's our best or at the very least most proven punt returner and kick returner on this team. But the bad part is that's about it. Even though statistically his yards per route ran and yards per catch for the Texans was actually like top notch but there's a reason they didn't throw it to him often when they did he made the most of it but we're not expecting anything out of him outside of special teams honestly so that's his biggest negative i mean he's literally just a return guy that's that's all we're expecting so if you can get return capability from adam humphreys from dax from deami brown steven sims curtis to any of these other guys then deandre carter is pretty much out of here but you never know if none of those guys can step up. It's going to be hard for us to use an entire roster spot on a guy that's only good at returning and can't contribute on offense. But hey, man, if nobody else steps up, it may have to be that. Then the next group, the black background guys, the other slash injured reserve guys, Jeff Bidette, Tony Brown, and Trevor Davis. I'm not expecting them to make this team at all. I'm not even entirely too sure if they make it to the 90-man roster heading into training camp. And then the main man of the hour, again, the catalyst of this video, pick 258th overall, last pick of the draft for us, Dax Milne positives first of all zach wilson's favorite target and that says a lot top four quarterback in this draft easily a lot of people has zach wilson as their number two and some even have him as his number one either way this was his favorite target that allowed him to look like that great quarterback i'm not saying dax milne made zach wilson at all I would say it's actually the other way around, if anything, but Dax Milne was still Zach Wilson's favorite target for a reason. First of all, he's a dependable slot receiver and deep threat. One of the better deep threats in this draft and easily one of the best slots in this draft floor wise. And he has no holes in this game. Route running, release, hands, IQ, very physical, yards at the catch. Everything is basically like above average to good. He's not necessarily elite at anything, even though I believe that his route running could eventually become elite, but with his athletic profile, his limited athleticism, easily the least athletic guy we took today. Even our long snapper is a more athletic long snapper than Dax Milne is as a receiver. Of course, Dax Milne is faster than Cheeseman, but relative to what position you're playing, Dax Milne is what you expect receivers to be able to do as far as explosion, speed, agility, and all of that. He's the least athletic guy we took in this draft, period. But again, he has no holes in his game. Probably the most well-rounded receiver in this class. And that's why a lot of people had him as a top 10 receiver. So the fact that we got him in the seventh round is crazy. He has a high floor. You know what you're getting out of him day one. At the very least, I'm very comfortable with him being our starting slot. Now, you never know if Adam Humphreys is ready to step up, if Steven Sims is ready to step up. But at the end of the day break glass in case of emergency worst case scenario dax milne can be a good slot receiver for us pure slot and also again he's a very good deep threat even though he doesn't have elite traits he doesn't have elite explosion acceleration speed or anything he's still a proven deep threat and he's also a decent returner again without high ceiling and crazy athletic traits like a lot of these receivers that i've already spoken about have and possess he's limited as a returner but he's very experienced and again he has a pretty high floor in it but you're never going to expect him to take anything to the house necessarily and then we get to the negatives like i've already spoken about just not the athlete like these other guys if we're talking about athleticism out of everybody i've talked about so far in this video dax milne Kelvin Harmon and probably Adam Humphreys are your least athletic receivers on the team right now. And that means he does not have a high ceiling. Pretty much what you're getting day one is what you're going to get. I mean, of course, he can improve his route running. Of course, he can improve his hands some. But he doesn't have this athletic profile where you're projecting, oh, yeah, the sky's the limit for him at all. But again, I love the fact that they went and got a very dependable, you know what you're getting day one. Day one starting slot when in doubt in Dax Mill. That was a great pick, honestly. And this video was mostly supposed to be about him. It's supposed to be a Dax Milne pick review and analysis and breakdown. But at the same time, I had to break down this receiving core because again, we have 14 guys. So I would be remiss if I didn't speak on that. But at the end of the day, I love this Dax Milne pick. 
definitely one of the better picks of the draft for us and now if you're looking at it as the general thesis of our draft strategy was as far as versatility freakish athleticism and high character he doesn't check the high athleticism because we definitely had at least a top three draft as far as freak athletes out of the entire nfl we have the most athletic draft class at the very least top three and dax milne is just the one outlier literally but he's definitely the high character he's definitely the versatile guy not as versatile as terry diami brown and curtis samuel of course who can play x y and z but i like the fact that we switched it up with that last pick and took a high floor guy somebody that we know again at the very least we have a good slot receiver in Dax Milne and we'll see what we get out of Steven Sims and Adam Humphreys out of the slot again he was Zach Wilson's favorite target for a reason but yeah man that's the end of this video please get in the comment section and let me know how you feel about Dax Milne the pick itself his breakdown what are his positives and negatives do you agree with mine do you love the pick and also definitely get in the comment section and let me know which receivers you think are going to make it because again we have 14 currently and at most i'm expecting us to keep it six we only kept five last year and with terry mclaurin diami brown and curtis samuel already taking up three spots that leaves only two three spots max left for kelvin Harmon, antonio gandy golden adam humphreys cam sims steven sims isaiah wright deandre carter and dax milne I mean, that is, bro, all those guys I just listed, two to three spots max. That is crazy. So get in the comment section and let me know who you think will be the six receivers. Or do you think just because we have so many talented guys, maybe they try to stretch it to seven and argue that, you know, Curtis Samuel also doubles as a running back in a way? I don't know. But definitely get in the comment section and let me know your thoughts on everything discussed in this video. Of course, please like this video if you liked it. If you learned anything, please subscribe if you haven't. Hit the bell next to the subscription button so you get a notification every time I release an informative and opinionated video like this one. I'm working on live streams for everybody in this draft class and including my boy Jarrett Patterson, the undrafted free agent who I feel like was honestly one of our best pickups this weekend. So stay tuned for all of that. Of course, the live streams will continue. I'm very busy today, so I may have to reschedule today's live stream to tomorrow as in Monday for us to do like a draft review. Because you know, every week I live stream Friday, 8 to 10 p.m. with Shayi, the Patriots fan, and every Sunday in the afternoon or evening for like two hours. But I may have to delay that till tomorrow. And of course, since it's after the draft, it's going to be more draft themed. And we can also take a look at some remaining free agents that we need to go get. So just stay tuned for all of that. Again, hit the bell next to the subscription button so you get a notification notification as soon as i schedule the live stream and as soon as i start them up and of course man i appreciate all of the support man this weekend was so great man all of the love all of the debates man again like i said i don't care if i agree or disagree with you as long as you prove your point with intelligence and integrity i'm not always right sometimes i may be wrong so even if i disagree i'm open to being wrong so i just want us to be a smarter fan base i just love the debates I'm, I'm here for all of the debates whether i agree with you or disagree with you it doesn't matter i just want us to be a smarter fan base as a whole so i loved all the debates i loved all of the support everybody that pulled up and liked the stream sharing it to everybody bringing more people to the street scores family shouts out to all of my new subscribers huge shouts out to all of my new members speaking of members big shouts out to everybody that donated over these over these past few live streams man i really appreciate y'all and of course huge shouts out to all of my sponsors shouts out to all of the new ones as well big shouts out to the pro bowl sponsors who name you see scrolling on the screen right now and a special shout out to my one all pro sponsor as well man i really appreciate all y'all i'll catch y'all later i'm out